to this GoGN webinar on April the 4th. You know that we have this series of webinars every first Wednesday of the month. It was just, um, it just happens that today is Tuesday because tomorrow we, we well, a lot of people are heading up to OER 17 in London, so we didn't want to clash with, with anyone. Um, so I'm very happy today and thank you, Casey, so much uh, because this is going to be a really great, I mean, all webinars are great, but I was, I've been looking forward to this one in particular. So we have with us uh, Katie Jordan, so Dr. Katie Jordan. Dr. Jordan, actually, Katie uh, got um, her PhD here with us at the Open University. Was it last November, was it? It was the, the very yeah. November that I got the degree in January, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Things happen anyway. But, uh, so Katie got her, her research, her PhD here. Uh, with us at the at the OU, and she did uh, some research on the impact of uh, use of, the impact of social networks on, on academic practice, which is pa partly what what she's going to talk about. But she's been doing research now for a number of years, and uh, research into education and research research into technology enhanced learning. And um, you, you, Katie, you may be tired of, of hearing this, or you guys probably heard it before. It's like, it's the, <laughs> Katie did some fantastic, I mean, all her research is fantastic, but she did some fantastic piece on MOOCs, um, kind of tracking registration and completion rates, and that was picked up by a lot of people, and it, so she became like a, uh, I don't, I'm going to say an online sensation, but it's more than that. It's like great, great, great research. So I invite you all not to read her thesis, but to read any of the stuff that she's, that she's written, um, because it's, it's really, really good work. So very happy that she's with us today, and she's, uh, she's giving us her time. So over to you. OK, great. Thanks, Faya. Um, that's, that was a wonderful introduction. Yep. Um, I'm sure that my MOOC stuff is going to probably turn out to be the most famous thing I ever do in my life. Um, I can pretty much retire now, uh, if only. But <laughs> no, um, but I'm not going to be talking about MOOCs today. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking about my PhD. Um, so um, the, the webinar is sort of going to be divided into two halves today. Um, the first part um, I, is going to be a fairly sort of um, sort of an overview of the, the key um, findings from my PhD. Um, and then I expect that will probably take about 20 minutes or maybe less. Um, and uh, then we can have a little break for a couple of minutes for any questions. Um, and then in the second part, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, Delete Academia Edu hashtag and uh, the debates that were um, going on surrounding that and some of the um, implications, particularly for uh, PhD students and early career researchers um, that sort of came out of um, that debate and the results of my PhD. Um, so my PhD uh, used a, a mixed method social network analysis approach to look at um, academics networks on um, social networking sites, particularly academia.edu, ResearchGate, um, and Twitter. And um, uh, uh, apologies if, if this looks is really teeny tiny, but um, um, just to, to clarify sort of what I mean by academic social networking sites, um, this is a timeline um, of social networking, when various social networking platforms were introduced. Um, the blue blocks um, show sort of generic sites, so the most famous ones really, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, and you can sort of see that following, a, 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 lagging a sort of a few years behind them, um, there was this slew of um, academic social networking sites that were sort of introduced to bring Facebook to scientists. Um, and uh, those can be sort of divided into two types of platform. Um, the pink blocks are um, ones that were very much Facebook for scientists. Um, so the, they were platforms that were centered around profiles and making links to others. Um, but the green, um, the green blocks also show a different type of um, 
academic social networking site uh, that platforms that started out providing a different type of service to academics. So bibliographic reference managers, um, things like SlideShare, um, and that subsequently added social networking um, functions sort of secondarily. Um, and um, in the, the grey blocks um, in recent years uh, chart the demise of some academic social networking sites. So there has been a sort of, um, there was this sort of proliferation and um, some things haven't made it. Um, and where we stand now, um, academia.edu and ResearchGate are the two biggest and most well-known sites. And that was my starting point, really, um, this sort of idea. They're, so they're Facebook for scientists, but what does that sort of mean? <laughs> and um, the idea of Facebook for scientists, um, the idea of having profiles and making connections to others, these, the network of connections is sort of a, a, a really fundamental characteristic of that kind of platform. Um, but when I started my PhD, no one had looked at what that app network actually looks like. Um, and the structure of social networks online um, will have implications for things such as um, how freely information flows through networks um, and uh, whether how, how power is distributed and that sort of thing. So that was my starting point, really. Um, again, sorry if everybody's squinting at <laughs> the tiny, tiny writing. Um, so my, my mixed methods design um, has included three phases. Uh, first of all, there was um, a, an online survey which over 500 people responded to. And that had sort of two aims. Um, first of all, uh, it was to get, gather a sort of baseline of data about academic sort of levels of use of different platforms and general perceptions about ways that uh, that these sites are useful. Um, but also I included uh, links to visualizations based on my own networks um, and uh, the participants were able to look at those and then indicate uh, whether they would like to take part um, in, in the second phase, which was the network analysis. Um, so for the network analysis, um, which is what I'm going to be focusing mainly on today, um, actually, no, I'm going to be talking about that on the interview. Um, <laughs> but the network analysis phase um, included 55 participants from within that pool. Um, it was sampled across a range of different job positions and subject areas. Um, and I, I, for each participant, I sampled their ego networks on two different platforms. So by ego network, um, I mean uh, the academic involved and their first degree contacts. So that's everyone that they're following and everyone who's following them um, and mapping any connections that exist between that group of people. Um, I focused on that level because I wanted to be able to find out what um, the network, the significance of the network to particular academics themselves. And people can't really comment on beyond um, their sort of first degree contacts uh, with any sort of certainty. Um, and I chose uh, to focus on either academia.edu or ResearchGate um, as an academic social networking site for each participant because there were disciplinary differences that emerged from the survey that different subject areas um, tend to use one site or the other. Um, Arts and Humanities is much more prevalent on academia.edu. Um, social sciences are sort of have a foot in both camps, um, but um, sort of uh, natural and physical scientists um, are much more likely to be using ResearchGate. Um, and uh, I decided to um, include um, Twitter as well because of the results of um, a large-scale survey that Nature ran in 2014 
and uh, this slide charts some of their is redrawn from some of their data. So um, here you can see academia.edu represented by the pink line and ResearchGate by the blue, um, and it sort of looks a lot like uh, the sites are being used sort of as a business card in ca in case in case contacted is the main thing there. Um, but also uh, discovering papers. Uh, there's emphasis on content um, and metrics. Um, it's interesting also to note the green line representing Mendeley here, uh, because Mendeley um, has received much more research focus than um, the other two, uh, primarily because it has an API, so it's a lot easier to get data um, out of Mendeley, yet compared to academia.edu and ResearchGate, it's not really used to the same extent. Um, but one of the most, the most striking thing for me that came out of the Nature Survey uh, was this, um, where if we look at um, uh, the sort of footprint of how people, academics, use um, their professional use of um, some of the biggest generic sites, so Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, um, LinkedIn is shown in grey here, and it's sort of a similar um, pattern to the academic social networking sites. But what's really striking is the difference with Twitter, um, shown in pink. Um, and uh, it came through really strongly in the results there, but um, uh, that's very much the site for uh, much more active um, engagement with uh, discussions and uh, discovering, discovering peers as well. Um, so, um, so it's for that reason that I that I chose to focus on those pairs. Um, I didn't want to just focus on one site alone. I wanted to get more of a sort of slice through um, uh, several sites. So, um, sort of long story short, on the uh, network analysis, um, the trends that emerged um, overall. Uh, were that um, the networks on academic social networking sites were much smaller um, than Twitter networks. Um, they were they tended to be uh, more sort of segmented into discrete communities that didn't really overlap that much, um, and uh, people were more likely to um, by having greater reciprocity, people were more likely to follow each other um, on academic social networking sites. Um, the example we've got here um, on the left uh, is um, academia.edu network, and on the right is a Twitter network um, for an arts and humanities lecturer who was a, who was approximately average if you ranked um, all of their networks in terms of size, um, and and it sort of illustrates those um, those characteristics quite nicely. Uh, Twitter, it's just much more of a sort of Free for all connections everywhere, um, <laughs> kind of um, kind of network. Um, I should also point out that the um, the color coding here of the nodes um, represents uh, the different communities that were identified by the um, network anal analysis software that I used, which was Gephi. Um, so these weren't identified by people at all or based on any characteristics. Um, from uh, the, the sites themselves. It's just based on um, an, an algorithm uh, which uh, sort of looks for clustering and, and cliques. Um, and, um, <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and um, you could sort of um, get some indications from, from the network structures that. that Sort of implied that um, uh, uh, academic social networking sites might um, sort of preserve things like academic hierarchy to a greater extent. Um, so, for example, um, on for the academic social networking sites um, networks, there was sort of a quite a clear progression in terms of um, uh, how big uh, networks were. The PhD students have the smallest networks, then it sort of went up to professors having the largest ones. Um, but some of those trends were then turned on their head uh, with the Twitter data. So PhD students and professors had the largest networks, whereas mid-career um, academics 
um, it, the sort of a U-shaped distribution is dead. Um, but there's only so much that you can get um, from uh, networks on their own. Um, so uh, to, to sort of dig into the data and really try to understand the processes that um, led to the trends um, in, in the networks, um, I then held um, um, some co-interpretive interviews with 18 of the, the participants. So the setup um, for the interviews, um, they were entirely done online. Um, because I'd been using Gephi um, for my network analysis, um, it's a really flexible program. And um, you can get a plugin for it to export um, networks um, as interactive web pages, so, um, which was really, really invaluable. Um, it's, um, it's spelled uh, G-E-P-H-I, um, Gephi. Um, it's great. Um, I can find a link <laughs> in a bit. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I would export the, uh, the networks for the participants and hosted them on a uh, password protected web space on my, my website. Um, and then the participants would access those from uh, their own location. Um, I also shared with them the sort of outline of the interview um, ahead of time. Um, and then when it came to the interview, we'd um, uh, set up Skype. Um, they would open the, the visualizations on their computer and we would do screen sharing. Um, and I would sort of start by inviting them to, to sort of take me on a walk around their network and to try to explain um, who, who was in there and, and why and its significance to them. Um, and I, I recorded the audio and video at my end using Camtasia and then um, uh, analyzed that um, later on. So um, uh, thinking about opening with looking at, um, at who and why, um, the main, one of the main um, reasons why um, we did that was to be able to understand um, the communities. And um, overall, the, uh, um, the communities that had been identified by Gephi um, were pretty accurate. Um, and this revealed that um, academic social networking sites um, tend to be, the networks tend to be dominated by sort of pre-existing face-to-face um, -face relationships. Um, so, uh, so the example here is, um, is Quentin, um, who's a um, lecturer in um, the social sciences and political science, in fact. Um, and um, so it tends to be institutions that um, they've worked at before um, or particular um, subject related um, uh, groups. So um, for example, here we have a research institute um, or, or professional societies that also um, would, would come up. Um, whereas on the, so on the left, it's his um, academia.edu network. Um, whereas on the right, we have um, his Twitter network and um, institutional affiliations were um, not so um, prevalent. Um, it was much more likely to be um, research topics um, without being sort of segmented into departments or institutions um, and personal interests. So um, the, the chart here just shows a sort of tally of how often that um, uh, communities were identified according to institution or topic or personal interest across the, um, the whole sample. Um, so academic social networking sites, the networks being, being a reflection of people who you've worked with in the past almost makes the cast of the network as a sort of relational CV. Um, whereas on Twitter, um, it's much more uh, sort of fluid whether people will choose to follow each other or not, and uh, much more based on what people are actually tweeting about. Um, and um, 
also if if that changes then um, it's uh, the, part the participants are much more likely to sort of um, uh, unfollow somebody on Twitter if they um, more readily than somebody um, who they've worked with before um, on academia.edu, which sort of explains the reciprocity findings um, from the network analysis. Um, and a mix of personal and professional um, came through very strongly as being um, part of the, the sort of logic of Twitter. It's sort of the done thing. Um, and um, there was much more of an emotional connection. Um, and um, that, that Twitter um, sort of reflected more of an authentic self um, than um, academic social networking sites, which were uh, very much a sort of professional, um, yeah, a professional academic self. Ah, so, oh, good. I'm glad you, this. I'm hoping this is this is um, readable because uh, <laughs> it's quite important. Um, so. Now I'm just going to move on to um, how um, how the participants explained their network structures, um, and this was very much um, related to uh, contrasting ways that uh, that they seem to conceptualise um, each of the sites. Um, so, in relation to academic social networking sites, um, two um, sort of analogies um, came out of it being like a business card or being um, a personal repository or a bit of both um, and um, uh, particularly for uh, PhD students and early career academics it was linked to a sense of finding creating a niche creating a home for your um, your professional self a way of locating that um, and um, in in some cases the, the relationship to the home institution was also um, alluded to because um, these an analogies of a, of a business card or a repository are sort of mirror um, uh, the roles played by um, profiles on institutional websites um, or uh, you know, institutional repositories. Um, but the need for portability um, between institutions um, and the, also being able to um, control um, content um, and and how it's presented um, sort of meant that um, the institutional repository was never going to um, replace um, these entirely. So um, in contrast, um, the the metaphor that uh, that came out with Twitter um, was one of um, a the, the 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 perpetual conference coffee break, so um, uh, a very much very much um, thinking of it as a, a space for professional interactions, but um, but it a sort of social um, more social space and where it's sort of okay to you know just strike up a conversation. Um, and the um, idea came up um, repeatedly that. Um, it's it's not enough on Twitter just to post links to your to your latest paper, as Francis said there. You need to include a bit of the personal too, um, and the, that's um, it's that mix that um, helps to um, build stronger to both both sort of reinforce um, existing professional relationships um, and also strike up um, new ones with people who you've never met before. Um, and um, uh, something that came up when we were talking about Twitter um, quite a lot was the idea of context collapse. So um, context collapse um, is uh, the idea that um, uh, on social networking sites um, you have all of these sort of nuanced relationships that all just get flattened down to being a Facebook friend or whatever. So the, the classic example would be if one of your friends posts a picture on Facebook of you inebriated and uh, and you're also friends with your gran and she sees it and is appalled and everyone gets thoroughly embarrassed um, that's context collapse so um, and uh, and context collapse didn't come up at all in the context of academic social networking sites um, it's such a sort of um, 
uh, yeah, a sort of polished, refined, here is my personal, my academic self um, presented there. Um, and also, this is also linked to ideas of audience too. Um, so the perception was that um, academic social networking sites are speaking to um, primarily an academic audience, but to reach um, a much more wider um, sort of social, social sort of spread, um, Twitter is much more valuable. Um, and uh, most of my participants had sort of come up with um, little mantras or um, sort of um, strategies for um, sort of mediating the moderating the kind of um, risk of complex collapse in the context of Twitter, but um, it hadn't actually experienced it as um, a problem. Right, this is sort of um, the midpoint. So if anybody has any questions, um, we could ask some of those. I just need to have a little bit of questions. Yeah. Okay, does anybody, do you have any, anybody, I see some people are typing. Does anybody have any questions for Katie so far? In the meantime, I might ask one myself. Or will I, will I, will I, will I? Okay, I will. <laughs> um, it's funny. It's funny because see the way when you talk about social networks, right? Um, the first thing that I I, I, the, I this is the first time that I hear you talk about your research, so it's not, I, I I didn't know anything about exactly what what was going on. But it's funny because I think of a social network, and immediately for some reason I think of interaction and I think of collaboration. So I found it I find it quite fascinating that you then you introduce this idea of a social network as a repository, really, where that interaction doesn't exist at all. Um, so I wonder to what extent, um, you know, whoever is responsible for uh, research gain or academia, like, are they happy in the sense that, yes, well, we actually, we are a repository, we are not actually a social network in the sense that we don't encourage uh, or we don't facilitate that kind of interaction. So it's, it's funny. Oh, well, that's, that's actually a really excellent segue into um, the next part where um, uh, about uh, delete academia edu because, um, yeah, what is social about academic social networking sites and what do they, what do they do <laughs> really? <laughs> um, and, uh, and they are sort of, um, they are businesses as well. Um, so, um, shall I, shall I, sort of kick off on the Hopefully. next one. Uh, Tabitha says she has to leave. That's okay, Tabitha. Thanks so much. So um, does anybody have any, any other quick question or shall we move on? Give me, a, give me a yes to move on or write your question if you have a question. Okay. Everybody's frantically typing. How long does it take to write? Yes. Yes, move on. Okay. Jeanette <laughs> says we, okay, Jeanette says we move on. So that means that we move Okay. Okay, great. So we leave the, we move on and we leave questions for the end. Okay. Okay. Um so um so delete academia edu um was a, a, a hashtag um that uh, sort of came to prominence um in January last year. And um it's, I'm, I'm just going to talk a little bit about sort of how it started um, because it, it is a little bit murky. Um, so on the, on the 27th of, of January um, 2016, Scott Johnson, um, an academic who used academia.edu, um, received um, this sort of market research type email. Um, hello. <laughs> um, uh, from uh, one of the team at um, uh, at academia.edu um, to sort of ask whether, in principle, um, he would be interested in the idea of if he could pay a fee for um, his papers to be to receive sort of greater um, prominence on the website. W would that be something that he would uh, be interested in doing? Um, so and. Um, he was, yeah, 
uh, needless to say, he was he was not interested in doing that, and uh, and was quite appalled um, about the the suggestion that um, that people might be able to do that. So so he took a screen capture of the uh, the message and um, and posted it on Twitter. And uh, this was picked up by the Chronicle of Higher Education, and uh, two days later they ran um, an article um, about about this and uh, how there'd been. Uh, little flurry of people sort of um, yeah sharing the view that uh, this was the sort of, the sort of suggestion that okay they do need to make money out of these sites but it's sort of it's it's not the sort of thing that the community that they're serving would really um, approve of generally um, and um, uh, later, later that day, on the 29th of January, um, uh, an academic um, in the UK read the read the Chronicle um, article and uh, tweeted and started the delete academia edu hashtag. Um, but uh, the whole thing was a little bit murky because um, that tweet didn't include the link to the story, um, or it just sort of said, "I'm going to delete academia edu. Who's with me?" sort of thing. Um, so uh, it. It sort of it prompted um, uh, a lot of debate. Um, you can see uh, on this chart the sort of uh, the the number of tweets um, per day um, on that hashtag, um, and, and uh, it it does it does sort of keep coming up as well. We see these little small um, spikes over time, um, and the d the debates that ensued um, sort of picked up on. Um, uh, Ideas about sort of platformization and commercialization, um, open access publishing, um, and the relationship with sort of academia um, itself. And the arguments against academia.edu um, were mostly based upon um, the not wanting your work as an academic to be exploited for their profit, um, for the platform's profit, um, and uh, depositing papers in um, open access repositories, um, institutional ones, but also others, um, for example, um, uh, SSRN, Social Science Research Network, is um, an online repository that anyone can have to. Um, and having your uh, your own blog um, as an alternative to uh, a profile. Um, but also, um, a number of counter arguments also emerged. Um, that um, uh, not everyone can freely upload um, things to repositories. Um, so PhD students being a particular group um, who um, you know, people were flagging up that um, they they weren't able to um, to to upload um, as easily um, uh, as sort of tenured more senior members of staff, um, and that uh, an individual blog uh, doesn't have the same uh, level of um, visibility. Um, it often doesn't show up in Google searches as well as um, uh, as a profile does, um, or or the social network attached to it, uh, which again is particularly important for um, PhD students and early career academics who are more peripheral um, in the sort of academic network. Um, so this also reflects um, uh, the results from my PhD. Um, where, with the importance of using the sites to find a niche and to have your um, your an, an online place for your um, formal academic identity. Um, so really, the um, uh, the delete academia edu hashtag um, stems from this question of what what does Academia.edu actually do. Um, it's um, it, the 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 email itself was that they 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 were ex exploring ways to sort of monetize the site because um, they are uh, sort of funded by um, venture capitalists um, and uh, and they do need to figure out how to make that work um, financially. Um, so. Um, here um, we have some headlines from uh, stories that have been run on TechCrunch, um, 
which is a, a, a great website for finding um, resources about various different um, startup websites. Um, and uh, I just sort of highlighted them um, to show that they're, they've been sort of trying to, to really do two things. Um, the um, uh, articles um, highlighted in pink relate to this idea of Facebook for scientists. Um, but the ones in blue um, also um, emphasize um, that they've seen themselves as being um, a type of open access publisher, um, really. Um, and um, that, they, that there might be more money in, in that sort of model, um, potentially. Um, and uh, I've also got this um, quote here at the bottom um, from the uh, uh, CEO of ResearchGate, um, which is it's, <laughs> it's a really interesting quote because it's so vague, and um, uh, and yet they've they've managed to secure quite a lot of money from uh, the Gates Foundation. I think um, forget about revenue until the network is valuable enough to command it, um, which is you know incredibly. Um, uh, <laughs> um, unclear about what they're actually going to do um, to monetize it in the future. Um, so there is a sense of um, that sort of saying that if you're not paying for it, you are the product um, in this context. So um, and the relationship um, uh, between academic social network sites and, and open access publishing is a bit, it, it has um, had its, um, it's, um, it doesn't sit easily um, because um, as um, came out of my, my research and, and other, other surveys have um, sort of shown similarly that um, uh, academics really do view the sites as being more like a business card um, uh, than um, than, a, than seeing it as a, a, a way of um, publishing, really. Um, and um, encouraging uploads of copyrighted material has got academia.edu in trouble um, in the past. Um, in December 2013, um, Elsevier started issuing takedown notices for um, to academics who'd put um, uh, papers published through them on academia.edu. Um, and this is this is quite an interesting. Um, it's something that people forget about um, because at, at that point in time, they were sort of academic academia.edu was sort of seen as um, a, being a bit of a champion for um, for open access um, and sort of upsetting the, the the publishers a little bit that way. Um, in contrast to um, uh, to the recent um, uh, delete academia edu, um, but. Um, the, uh, the, the chunk of text at the bottom here is sort of a, a, a cautionary note um, about um, um, academic social networking sites as open access publishing uh, publishers because um, this comes from the Research Council's UK guidelines. So um, if you're doing research in the UK, um, the, there's this, this, this key bit of information here. Um, about um, metadata um, that uh, academic social networking sites don't satisfy the metadata requirements um, for RCUK to count as um, an open access um, uh, platform. Um, so um, they, they do require you to um, increasingly to make um, the results of your research OA, but that wouldn't technically um, meet the, the guidelines there. And with um, open access being written into the next ref as well, um, it's um, whether academic social networking sites would, would count um, for that, um, I'm not so sure. I personally would, if you've, if you've got access to an institutional repository, I would upload it there. <laughs> but um, it is a tricky grey area, actually, with the ref, um, because if you're an early career researcher, you may well be um, between publishing 
the results of your PhD whilst between institutions. Um, uh, but uh, there is um, someone, someone did find me in the small print for the um, BOA guidelines for the ref, but um, that's not, it's okay, they do take that into account apparently. But, um, but just to emphasize that if you do have access to an institutional repository, upload, <laughs> upload there. Um, but also on the repositories note, um, in Google searches, uh, if people are searching for a specific paper that you've written, um, then um, repositories tend to perform better. Uh, but if they're, people are searching for your name, um, then academic social networking sites um, perform uh, a lot better. So um, the, the, the message here, um, I guess, is to sort of um, go for everything, really. <laughs> But uh, not um, uh, within reason. Anyway, um, so I just wanted to return to the, um, the idea of having of finding a niche um, uh, because um, PhD students and early career researchers um, might not even be represented on their institutional website. Um, but having an academia that is your research gate profile is something that you can. Uh, take with you and um, and you can sort of build it build up that portfolio um, of um, things and uh, and sort of have some control over your um, your online identity um, so for example within four, within two weeks of um, the corrections being uh, accepted on my thesis my profile was promptly deleted from our departmental website <laughs> so <laughs> um, so yeah uh that's uh, yeah it's an example of just how quickly you know um you can uh things like that can disappear um but <laughs> um um so being being um as as a phd student um uh it's you are very sort of precarious your relationship with um with academia and and the institution is um, you are sort of liminal really um, uh, so I think that the, the sort of take home here is that um, you probably need to yeah um, go for um, uh, a multifaceted approach um, in order to really uh, try and um, boost your chances and your presence um, so um, sort of an, an underpinning um, uh, all of these um, so um, having a blog is is a great way of building um, your a portfolio and um, a place for your um, ideas uh, but it doesn't have the same kind of um, uh, visibility um, in Google searches and as a um, if you're as an early career researcher or PhD student, um, you are, you know, inevitably um, not as well known. Um, so having coupling that with an academic social networking site profile um, is, you know, a good way of um, hedging your bets there. Um, similarly, um, Um, in terms of the personal repository, um, if you have got access to an institutional repository, um, it's, um, I would always say it's best to, to deposit there um, because um, it's, it's sort of the gold standard. Um, but also, um, putting things on academic social networking sites too, um, you are quite possibly going to be reaching a um, a slightly different audience. Um, there may well be sort of serendipitous um, discovery of your papers through the, the social network, the social networks on those. Um, it will be interesting to see whether um, the role of the network uh, does turn out to be sort of emphasised um, to a greater extent. Cause it's, it's not really, um, um, oh, by, by gold standard, I sort of mean, um, uh, you know, the, the, the metadata um, and the um, aggregating and um, that um, uh, 
uh, um, e.g., um, uh, things from Oro feed into Google Scholar, and um, everything just sort of, you know, mixed up. That much better compared to academic social networking bytes. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. And the persistence and um, and librarians do, um, you know, sort of um, look after it for you. <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, but um, but also really underpinning all of this um, is um, uh, to uh, uh, do Twitter as well because that provides much more of an in infrastructure for spreading um, things that you posted on these on the variety of sites um, to a much more um, wider um, audience and uh, and those those connections that you didn't even know existed. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's my why well, I don't think you should delete academia.edu, but uh, don't rely just on academia.edu either sort of thing. Um. <laughs> Oh, that's an interesting question, Dinesh. Um, oh, um, um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, um, Mm, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether it um, challenges the neutrality of research. Uh, that's going to be one for me to think about. <laughs> yeah, I'm. The, I mean, what springs to mind immediately is sort of the biases that are introduced into um, what gets published in the first place. Um, um, you know, through um, peer review um, and yeah, um, that sort of thing. Um. So, for anyone, just for anyone who wasn't actually reading the <laughs> reading the reading the chat, the the question is about the neutrality of of. Um, repositories and social academic networks so we we are like we could get into some kind of an not argument but um and i i i work with two philosophers so I'm, I'm always very careful now every time i talk about a philosophical argument and um, but it's uh, yeah i wonder you know we 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 get into this concept of what counts as neutral and what doesn't count as neutral um, does, does the argument change if we talk about objectivity? Probably not. We we'll still be at the very. Oh, <laughs> um, we got probably a couple of uh, more minutes, like two, three minutes for for questions. If anyone has any other questions, so uh, Janet is saying recommendation engines on journal sites have helped have, have helped him find mm -hmm. papers. I otherwise may not have, so it has it has a benefit. Yeah, yeah. It's always, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's definitely one to think about. I can sense myself doing a blog post about it in a couple of weeks' time <laughs> when I've let it, um, you know, um, uh, <laughs> when I've let it digest a bit. But uh, but yeah, that that is a really interesting one. Thanks for that. Okay. This, uh, do we have any more questions or comments or or anything? I particularly like and and I hope if I mean I'm gonna send the link to all GoGN people and beyond. But I particularly like this last your last slide, your take home messages as in because it makes perfect sense. Whether you know we've been going on about getting students to blog and but you're absolutely right that it is just not enough. It's about Finding your nation, building your network, and being out there with your this is my my mm -hmm. card kind of thing. So it, it's I find this extremely helpful. So thanks very much. Um, any more questions? Any more comments? Anyone? 
interesting and useful. Okay. Just, just out, completely out of curiosity, how many of you um, have a, a profile on, say, Academy A2? So, so not necessarily, so not, not on Twitter, because I'm, I, I know some of you have been on Twitter or are on Twitter, but how many of you actually have, have this kind of academic profile? Yeah, so there's a bit, so there's a, there's a bit, there's a bit of, there's a bit of everything. Yeah, uh, remember, I think Orchid also counts as probably as as uh, as as your as some kind of repository of your profile as well. Um, my uni recommend uploading people to academy. I do. So yeah, so I, I suppose if your if your institution doesn't have a repository, it makes perfect sense as well. Um, oh, okay. Okay, any, so any research? Any research? Again, I missed that. Okay, people are still typing. So I let them type away. Um, that's, 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 oh, I, I, I asked um, any ResearchGate users um, because I, I sense that it's sort of only a matter of time before um, there's a, a delete ResearchGate type thing. Um, uh, they, they seem to have sort of escaped the controversy so far. Okay, people are just typing away. <laughs> Okay, we've just basically we're coming up to uh, to five o'clock. I invite you all if you have any other questions, um, to just tweet them. Tweet oh. them. Yeah, just, go ahead. Just to, answer, just to answer Janesh's question about potential monetization strategy, um, the one that Academia.edu seems to be um, pursuing um, most actively at the moment uh, is to to monetize the metrics. Um, so if you if you want to um, get more detailed information about about the users who have been reading your papers, um, say to include in um, a case for promotion. So it's sort of aimed at um, um, academics who are looking to get promoted. Um, so not not the sort of um, uh, really uh, early career um, PhD students. Um, and uh, yes, and you can pay to get um, to get that kind of information. So in that sense, you might you might find yourself being you know mentioned in a sort of um, uh, in a sort of aggregated way um, in these reports. Um, I, I don't I don't know exactly the the level of um, uh, information that they that they put into that if they sort of list specifically the people who have reading your um, papers, um, or if they sort of say um, you count as you know a PhD student from the UK downloaded this paper. Um, um, I almost want to actually pay to find out, <laughs> but uh, 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 one day maybe I will. Um, in the name of research, um, um, but that's that's the main thing that, that they seem to be doing at the moment. Uh, ResearchGate, I'm not so sure. Um, although they do, ResearchGate do seem to be um, increasing the number of metrics that um, that they use because uh, they have the ResearchGate score, which is another way of um, it's very it's very linked to um, citation counts and um, impact factors of the journals that you publish in. Um, but uh, but they do seem to be developing the range of um, metrics that they have. Um, recently, they started including uh, reach, which is a score that's sort of vaguely based on networks um, in terms of 
sort of how many first degree contacts you have and how many second degree contacts. Um, so going going that step further than the networks that we were looking at today. Um, to and, and they come up with scores for sort of the potential sort of trickle down of your papers. Um, but um, I suspect that they, they may well um, go the same way as academia.edu and um, start charging for metrics. But um, it remains to be seen. Hey, thanks very much. Um, with that, I think we're gonna we're gonna close. Um, so thank you very much. It's been it's been great. I mean, I know that I've been looking forward to this webinar, so it's uh, it 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 hasn't disappointed me. That's that's for sure. So um, there we go. <laughs> Honestly, no. Thank you so much for giving us your time. And um, anyone, anyone who wants to continue the conversation, just go on and 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 send us a tweet and uh, tweet Katie, of course. Um, if not, um, again, thank you very much to everyone for coming. And uh, we've all, you know, we've got people here from the four corners of the world. So thank you for getting up early or staying out, you know, staying up late. Um, I'll see you all hopefully uh, the first Wednesday of next month, which is going to be May already. Woohoo! Okay. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Gacy. Thanks. <laughs>